This is Dr. Sam Magertson. This is part two from one primary care doctor to another questioning the cholesterol treatment guidelines. This part two contains the appendices to part one. There are five appendices. Once again, the disclaimer, this presentation is to raise questions, not to recommend treatment or provide medical advice. The information is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use this information as an alternative to consultation with your physician. If you have any questions about any medical matter, you should consult your doctor or other health care provider. Always consult with a qualified medical professional before making medication decisions. Appendix 1, how did we come to believe what we do believe about cholesterol and statins. Since the 1800s, there have been major changes in the U.S. diet and a rise in cardiovascular disease. Before the lipid hypothesis was widely accepted, other hypotheses were proposed. There is the sugar hypothesis, and there are hypotheses in regards to a change in the fats we consume. To understand the history of our acceptance of the lipid hypothesis, we must also review the alternatives. Sugar consumption has been rising since the 1800s. In about 1900, corn oil was first used in commercial cooking, and in 1911, Mazzola corn oil was marketed and Crisco was introduced by Procter and Gamble. The first published report of myocardial infarction in the United States appeared in 1912. In 1924, the American Heart Association was founded in part to promote research to understand the increase being seen in heart disease. In 1936 appeared the first study I could find comparing serum cholesterol to atherosclerosis Victims of sudden violent death were evaluated at autopsy and the serum cholesterol compared to the aortic fat content. And as you can see, no relation of serum cholesterol to aortic disease was found. This study did not find evidence that serum cholesterol was related to vascular disease. In 1948, the Framingham study was funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute it is an ongoing epidemiologic study of the factors associated with cardiovascular disease. Healthy people were recruited and followed every two years with questionnaires and exams. The study has generated multiple publications over time and continues today. In 1953, Ansel Keys published the Six Countries Study. Ansel Keys is a key person in the history of our acceptance of the lipid hypothesis. He showed an association between a country's fat consumption and coronary heart disease mortality. This is a graph from his study comparing coronary death to percent of calories from fat. This has been criticized because he picked out the six countries from the 22 countries for which data were available in order to get this clean curve. If data from all 22 countries were included, the graph would look like this. Since the time of the study, populations have been identified with very high fat intake and virtually no coronary artery disease, raising further questions about Key's association. In 1956, the American Heart Association held a nationally televised fundraiser broadcast simultaneously on all three national channels. Ansel Keys, now a member of the American Heart Association and others, promoted the lipid hypothesis and, re and recommended the prudent diet, and that is one in which corn oil, margarine, chicken, and cold cereal replaces butter lard, beef, and eggs. This promotion was marred when Dr. Paul Dudley White, likely the most renowned physician in the country at the time, 
a co-founder of the American Heart Association, a writer of a major text on heart disease, a promoter of the Framingham Heart Study, and who personally attended President Eisenhower when he had an attack, a heart attack in office, objected on the live broadcast. See here, I began my practice as a cardiologist in 1921, and I never saw an MI patient until 1928. Back in the MI-free days before 1920, the fats were butter and lard, and I think we would all benefit from the kind of diet we had at a time when no one had ever heard the word corn oil. He certainly wasn't accepting the lipid hypothesis, and this comment suggests he may have felt that vegetable oils were a problem. A year later, John Yudkin published an article showing that sugar consumption was more closely associated with the rise in heart disease than was fat consumption. He later published a book about this, Pure, White, and Deadly. So in the 1950s, there were differing hypotheses for the dietary factors contributing to heart disease, saturated fat, hydrogenated oils, and sugar. By 1960, there were almost 500,000 recorded deaths in the United States from heart disease. In 1963, Ansel Keys published the Seven Countries Study, showing associations between cholesterol, smoking, hypertension, and lifestyle, and coronary artery disease. In 1968, the American Heart Association had printed and was prepared to release guidelines that contained a statement critical of partial hydrogenation. Fred Matson, a research chemist for Procter & Gamble, was a member of the American Heart Association Advisory Board, and he convinced the American Heart Association to, disca to discard these guidelines and replace them. The discarded guideline contained this statement, partial hydrogenation produces trans fats, currently available shortenings and margarines are partially hydrogenated and may contain little of the natural, healthier fats. Fred Matson worked for the makers of Crisco. The revised guidelines did not mention trans fats, but did recommend that we reduce animal fat, decrease saturated fats, and increase polyunsaturated fats, reduce cholesterol, maintain ideal body weight, and apply dietary recommendations early in life. From 1973 to 1977, the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs was chaired by George McGovern. The final report from the committee was the Dietary Goals for the United States, which claimed that animal fats cause and vegetable oils prevent cancer and heart disease. An independent review found errors, including basic math errors in the report, and came to opposite conclusions. Here is George McGovern reading from a box of Quaker Oats, Quaker Oats King Vitamin cereal. The year the report was produced, Hubert Humphrey said this, HEW has avoided the area of prevention like the plague, and it's about time the USDA moves in. It's going to take this aspect of the nutrition program, whether it wants to or not. HEW, Health Education and Welfare, has since divided to become the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education. The Food and Agricultural Agriculture Act of 1977 directed the USDA to establish a comprehensive human nutrition research program and with this the USDA became the predominant voice in human nutrition recommendations. This created a problem we still have today. There are seven undersecretaries within the USDA, only one of which, the one in the center, addresses human nutrition. The others have more to do with agriculture, and the one on the far right addresses agricultural marketing. In this structure, human nutritional recommendations have to compete with the health of the agricultural industry. In 1984, the LRC, the Lipid Research Clinic's Coronary Primary Prevention Trial, was published. We've discussed this study, this so-called final proof of the lipid hypothesis, 
in some detail. Later that year, the NIH held a consensus conference on cholesterol and heart disease. A panel of 14 experts listened to dissenting opinions, but these opinions were not included in the final report. The conclusions were, individuals with elevated cholesterol levels were at risk, mass screening was advocated, the prudent diet was recommended, and again that's one that replaces butter with margarine and animal fats with vegetable oils. And quoting from the report, it has been established beyond a reasonable doubt that lowering definitely elevated blood cholesterol levels will reduce the risk of heart attacks caused by coronary heart disease. Presumably, this is a reference to the LRC, which we have reviewed and which we may not accept as adequate proof of this claim. In 1985, the National Cholesterol Education Program was launched with the goal of reducing death from coronary heart disease by reducing cholesterol levels through educational efforts directed at physicians and the public. We were now fully committed to the lipid hypothesis despite relatively weak evidence, primarily the associations of Ansel Keys and the so-called long-sought definitive evidence of the LRC, we were fully committed to our current course despite dissenting views, alternative hypotheses, and contrary evidence. Appendix 2. Triglyceride HDL ratio. It is recognized that elevated triglycerides and low HDL levels predict risk. But medications to lower moderately elevated triglyceride levels is associated with poor outcomes, namely more adverse events. If elevated triglycerides predict risk, why isn't treatment helpful? Because this is an association and not a causation, confusing association with causation has been problematic in our acceptance of the lipid hypothesis. One hypothetical explanation is this. The high triglyceride, low HDL pattern may indicate the liver is processing excess sugar to produce triglycerides at the expense of HDL. The high triglyceride, low HDL pattern may be a manifestation of excess sugar, insulin resistance, and metabolic syndrome. Treating the lipids does not alter the insulin resistance. Perhaps when you see this lipid pattern, you might consider this approach for selected patients. You may be consuming too much sugar and may be developing insulin resistance. The best initial treatment may be to reduce your sugar intake. In this study, young adults were given high fructose corn syrup sweetened beverages for two weeks and they did develop an elevation in their triglyceride levels and in their LDL levels. This graph compares a high-fat diet to a low-fat diet. The fourth set of bars from the left is the triglyceride level, and the red bar, the high-fat group, lowered triglycerides more than the diet with more carbohydrate. And the fifth set of bars from the left is the HDL level, and the high-fat diet increased the HDL, and the low-fat diet did not. Appendix 3, Diet Heart Hypotheses. We have the lipid hypothesis, but this has been demonstrated to be inconsistent with many of the studies we've reviewed on diet and heart disease. And we have the sugar hypothesis. This is consistent with epidemiologic data, patient cohort data, and the known biochemistry. On the bottom of the slide is a study relating sugar consumption to increased cardiovascular disease mortality. And there is the inflammatory fat hypothesis. Excess omega-6 fatty acids are inflammatory. We know that trans fats are harmful. There is also concern that our diets have changed with an increase in inflammatory omega-6 fatty acids and this may be contributing to vascular disease. Appendix 4, Dietary Recommendations. 
We've already discussed the organizational chart of the USDA and the potential problem that the interests of human dietary recommendations and the interests of the agricultural industry may be in conflict. To see that this is a problem, it may be helpful to look at the case of Louise Light. She was a USDA Director of Dietary Guidance and Nutritional or Nutrition Education Research in the 1970s. Her team designed the first food pyramid. Her proposed pyramid included increased fruits and vegetables, limited refined carbohydrates, and reduced sugar to less than 10% of total calories. Grains were reduced to a maximum of two to three servings per day. The Secretary of Agriculture reviewed these recommendations and returned them with significant changes, increasing grains to six to 11 servings, reducing vegetables and fruits, and the proposed aggressive increase in sugar was changed to a diet moderate in sugar. Light objected to these changes and expressed concern about a potential increase in obesity and diabetes, but was overruled. So the structure of the USDA is problematic. It appears our dietary recommendations are influenced by other than a strict focus on human health. This slide shows representations of dietary recommendations for the U.S. beginning with the 1956 Basic Four on the lower left. The upper left is a representation of a pyramid recommended by Louise Light, but which was never endorsed or used. The upper right was the recent dietary pyramid, and the lower right is my plate. My plate allows for more grain products and sugar than did the recommendations proposed by Louise Light. My plate includes recommendations to limit hard fats, lumping trans fats and saturated animal fats together, and to limit cholesterol and to avoid added sugars. This slide and the next one are for fun. This seems to be the pyramid many Americans are following. And you see the fictitious Association of American Corporations for Freedom of Choice for Food. This one is for another common or a common subgroup in our population. And you might find it interesting that the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare does not accept the USDA recommendations as being based on current science. Their Council on Health Technology Assessment, after an extensive and rigorous review of the evidence, endorsed a high-fat diet as a healthy option. Appendix 5, the reading and viewing list. These books all question our approach to cholesterol. I found the first three most helpful. The second book by Barbara Roberts, who is a cardiologist and has a focus on women and heart disease. The third book is excellent and contains a good review of how to critically analyze research articles. He includes two example studies and critiques them in detail. The last four books are all excellent. Each author has also done YouTube videos. Robert Lustig's Sugar the Bitter Truth Has Gone Viral. I would recommend it to all physicians and diasticians and to any interested person. He is a neuroendocrinologist in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco. In the video, he reviews the biochemistry for the metabolism of sugar and fructose and gives a convincing case for sugar being a major, major problem. Here are several more interesting um, videos. This ends the appendices to from one primary care doctor to another questioning the cholesterol guidelines and I thank you very much for your attention.